the panel topic, if you've not read ahead in the programme, I shall enlighten you, or at least I shall read it out for you, is what's the problem, technology or how we use it? So, as written in the programme, today's technology landscape presents an ever-widening range of devices that people may use for both personal purposes and business benefits. However, security demands often mean that technology needs to be controlled to reduce the risks in an organisational environment. <coughs> This can represent a barrier to staff who wish to do things that require reducing security and an overhead for IT administrators who have to manage an increasingly wide range of devices. As a consequence, we have a conflict, or at least a potential conflict, between the inherent capabilities of the technology, the desires of its users, and the needs of the business. So the panel will consider how such conflicting demands can be managed and hopefully resolved. And so to assist us on this journey this afternoon, we have the, the two gentlemen sat here. We have Stuart Baker, a cybersecurity strategist from Securius. So Stuart is a cybersecurity professional specialising in digital forensics and has experience of working in both public and private sectors. His experience includes working as a mobile device examiner for Devon and Cornwall Constabulary's data forensics unit. He also holds a first class honours degree in digital forensics from Staffordshire University and also has worked as a frontline technical support in a large IT company. And our other panellist is one of our panel regulars who you may recognise, John Finch, the Information Governance Manager from Plymouth City Council. So, uh, as I say, John manages uh, the information governance aspects of the council here, responsible for data protection, security policy development and management, managing the information asset register, managing security incidents, and providing security advice for the council and its partners, and also security awareness and education for senior management. So, John has just a few small tasks on his plate. He's currently a CISP and undertook an IT master's here at Plymouth University back in 2001. Doesn't seem that long ago, does it? John? It does. it does, all right. Well, I can remember when John was a student, but apparently it's a long time ago for him. Uh, with a thesis um, supervised by me entitled um, Approaches to Establishing IT Security Culture. So if there is anything John doesn't know, you can blame the poor education he got from me as his project supervisor. So, as is usual in these panel sessions, I'll start things off just to warm the panel up and also to give you some opportunity to think about the things they say and the things you'd like to ask them because they are the source of the expertise and the knowledge here. I'm merely a facilitator. So, and then you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. I will regularly ask you if you've got an opportunity to ask questions and it's a race then who can get their hand up before Bob does. Okay, so first question for the panel. If we've got the technology, and the technology is capable, why shouldn't we use it to its, ex its fullest extent? Uh, good afternoon. Um, just move this a bit. Uh, why shouldn't we use technology to its full extent? Um, well, take smartphones. Smartphones are great. You can do a lot of things with smartphones, but there's also a lot of legislation around some of the data that you collect. So, um, take a recent example, um, which might be theoretical, uh, where we've got people involved with legal cases taking pictures using smartphones. Now, as soon as you use a smartphone, you're bringing the chain of evidence into question, um, and that evidence can be questioned in a court of law and challenged by any half-decent lawyer. Whereas before, they actually had to have a mobile telephone and a camera and you can't um, repudiate the evidence that's taken on a camera as easily as you can as a smartphone because smartphones got editing software on there, various things but at the end of the day people want to be able to carry as little equipment as they can as possible. Now this has actually happened with um, doctors and various other people using smartphones whereas before they would use proper medical equipment to take pictures, now they're using smartphones and although the technology is there and it's easy for them to use, there's things like data being um, sent to cloud, syn synchronised with personal devices, all sorts of aspects that really people are not thinking about when they're using this technology. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that. I mean, you bring up some really good points about um, you know people using it in law enforcement. I have first-hand experience of. Uh, police officers going, being, going out on scene and instead of using police provided equipment instead they'll be like oh I'll just take some photos on my smartphone um, 
and yeah, it does exactly that, you know, because there's so many things you can do with a photo on a smartphone, it can cause real problems when you're trying to put it through chain of custody. Um, and you find that if you just use the equipment provided, which is designed solely for that one specific reason, it would have just completely removed all of those issues from the get-go. <clears throat> So it's really down to people understanding the legislative purposes of what they're trying to do and thinking about whether equipment is appropriate, but um, because they've been given devices that can do so much, they're not necessarily thinking about that. So is it a question of providing guidance to people then? Is it another education piece that people ought to, if they're not going to think about it naturally, getting them to think more about whether it's appropriate to use the technology? Well, a lot of these people, um, take police officers for example, they've been fully trained, they know all about the, the chain of custody, um, and, and the same with other people in legis legislative areas that are undertaking these tasks, they, they're fully trained, they know the law, but it's all about convenience. Yeah, I mean, people always try and take the most easiest route, they go, well, if this device can use it to solve all of my problems, why do I need to take the longer route round to get exactly the same result? Um, and they're the same with person. The chances are they'll have a personal smartphone on there and they're just not thinking about the actual um, consequences or other implications. It's um, easy just, just to try and get, grab the evidence while you can. Yeah, I mean, even on a sort of a lighter scale, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think to <coughs> sort of work emails and stuff like that, I, I have a work assigned phone which I use for emails, calls, and such. One. Um, but it is that temptation of well, my work phone's just sat on my desk over there and I'm over here. I'm sure I can just pull it out, log into Outlook, and then there's all of my emails, but... Did I cut up? Yep. Oh. Oh. Always n n nice fun technical problems. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it's too easy to just pull out your other phone and log into an Outlook account and look at all emails, but then that gets mixed in with your personal information, and then if you leave the company, you have artifacts left on your personal device of which they want to get rid of, but... And, and if you think about it, that, that what we're actually doing now, instead of where someone needs to make a phone call and take a picture, we're giving them a full-blown computer to do, do a couple of those tasks, so they're, they're using it to all of its potential. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, does that prompt any questions, comments from the floor so far? We have a hand there. Where is the microphone going to come from? We have two people running with microphones now, so we need to keep them busy. Uh, yeah, besides the uh, legislation involved with uh, various devices and the, uh, the problems with the um, uh, police, and would there be like moral and ethical issues involved with various uh, software or hardware? Because like um, certain programs would uh, obviously the invasive to privacy, things like Facebook, it's, although it's great to put up your life and stuff and that on Facebook, it can also be uh, a huge detriment, like uh, vengeful girlfriends or uh, you put up a picture when you're drunk one night and suddenly it's a lot harder to get employed, you know? So is it, like, is it morally right? Well, um, take the example of doctors. Doctors are constantly using smartphones to take pictures of patients conditions they might not actually have they might actually be using their own phones to do this and anyone from the NHS has experienced it is a big issue um, but you have no guarantee that they've got the proper settings um, appropriate for that type of data applied on that phone so all those photos could be synchronized with Dropbox um, Google Photos um, iPhotos various different things and who knows where, where that data is actually going? So there's a big moral issue of um, should they be doing it on a completely uncontrolled device that's not appropriate for that purpose? Uh, you also bring up a good point about you know what people put on social media these days. Um, I think you know I've seen cases where people would just put their entire lives on social media, which is great if you've got a small or you've got people living far away, you want to keep in touch and whatnot, but you still need to be very careful of what information you're putting out there because employers, not so much these days as far as I'm aware, but they still can, will go through your social media and see what you've been putting on there, which, again, ethically can be a bit questionable because you don't, you're not in full control of 
what people put about you on your own social media? Um, although, although another aspect with social media is it's used by our corporate fraud team to investigate benefit fraud, where people are claiming single person discount with council tax and they're happily posting pictures of their marriage ceremony and um, their house where they're living with their partner all over social media for everyone to see and are all completely unlocked and it's a very valuable investigation tool that is actually legally um, allowed to be used. Okay, so show of hands for the audience just a minute before we take the next question. Hands up if you've ever posted something that you subsequently regretted on social media. So I'll put my hand up on that one as well. These people there. <laughs> and hands up if you had something posted about you on social media by somebody else that you'd have preferred they didn't post. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. And now uh, we had a hand here from Bob. Where's the microphone? It's coming, it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> Only one question at a time, Joel. Um, the, the question comes to the use case for modern technology. I think we all appreciate the flexibility and the comprehensive applications we can use on a smartphone. Uh, but it's been the case where our movement has been tracked for many, many years over mobile networks. And now our behavior is being analyzed by many, many companies from Google to right the way through on what we're doing, where we're going, what we're looking at, what we're buying, where, which restaurant we're going to, <clears throat> and we are going to be targeted with more adware. So I think there are two ends to the spectrum of an application <laughs> use case. There's the people who deliver services or products or retailers, and there are the users. And both need to be educated. It's no use just educating the users corporate behavior is becoming tarnished as well. And the commercialism, the monetizing of data is going to increase. The value of data to companies is tremendous. And behavior of re consumers is what drives advertising and purchase decisions. So have you got any comments about those? Well, I, I totally agree that um, the commercialization aspect is a major factor. Um, because it's far easier for a company just to develop an app that goes on a smartphone than some of the big corporate applications that had to in the past. So take our parking department, um, whereas before they had bespoke machines for giving tickets and various other devices they had to carry with them, the parking um, company that does this have just developed an app and given them Android phones so they're walking around um, just using this app. But also, um, the data about where they're going is being collected somewhere. And there's a big risk, which nobody's really considered, is if actually if you're monitoring where parking enforcement officers are going, you might be able to see a pattern, and all of a sudden you know where you can park for free. Is there, is there such a pattern, John, that you can share? <laughs> First of all, I'll learn about that parking app. We just find some free parking around Plymouth. It's pretty difficult these days. <laughs> um, in regards to sort of companies starting to like profile and the building of ad centers and all that kind of stuff, um, I mean, with GDPR coming in, the wonders of GDPR, um, obviously they have to be a lot more specific about the information they're gathering from you. So it does make it a little bit more difficult for the companies because beforehand uh, they could literally just freely gather whatever information you put on their website and use it pretty generously, as ho however they decide to use it. Um, you know, with GDPR coming in, the rights of the de uh, the person, you know, you can actually start trying to push back on that and trying to claim your rights to be forgotten so they can get rid of that or at least get more control over what companies are actually using your data for. So you, you've given us some examples already, but do you have any other examples of where this conflict between the, the capability and the control of technology can cause issues? Quite a few. I mean, there's one example, our communications team. They um, <clears throat> take videos and pictures of events. Now, they used to have a video camera, and they've now been given a smartphone, and they want to be able to take videos and um, be able to tweet about events and really be connected, yet um, 
the devices they've got are not managed sufficiently to be able to be connected to our network because there's a com conflict between um, what we can connect and um, what people would like to do with those devices. So you've got an Android phone, big risk um, in terms of malware and, um, and uh, no mobile devices and especially Android. It's the big gr biggest growing area of malware. Um, so we need to be able to manage these devices, but there's also a payoff with our IT department or our IT provider that to configure those devices and lock them down really tightly, there's um, a, a quite a heavy additional cost for that. So people want to be able to use them and connect it whatever devices they can to whatever they want, um, whereas there's a big payoff between the cost of doing that and whether we can actually um, comply with some of the legislation and some of the requirements that um, external organisations want. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a growth market. You see nowadays there's loads of companies building out into that mobile device management system for corporate um, solutions where you can control what you can actually do on a mobile phone. Um, we were looking into it quite heavily within our company of uh, a potential way to control, especially in regards to trying to be compliant within um, ISO and other kind of compliances like that. You know, you ha it, there has to be very specific controls into what users can do because if you leave it completely open, then you don't have that control and it does o lead to potential security risks. Um, and these management services can as you say, cost a huge amount of money, and if somebody wants to try and go around it, unfortunately, there is always a way. <laughs> um, people, if they want to do something uh, malicious or outside of the scope, and you try and put in restrictions, they will try and find a way. And uh, most of the time, they'll end up using their own devices. So that. Uh raises a question for me. I mean, a lot of what we've been hearing about, uh, well, two themes are coming through. One is people do things, perhaps that they shouldn't do, and the other is around mobile devices. So let's pick up, firstly then, people. Why are they such a problem to manage when it comes to information security? Um. <laughs> Easy question. <laughs> um, one, they generally don't understand the risks. Um, I spend a lot of time trying to explain the risks to people of various things and um, some of you might remember the uh, presentation I did a couple of years ago around a website that got compromised um, and the details of 1700 people were taken from a, um, a, a website that processed information about children and the reason that got um, it became a live system because the people who commissioned it really didn't understand the risks and didn't understand the sort of people that are trying to get data and the value of that data. And that's one thing that moving, um, moving forward, GDPR is going to um, provide some better understanding of the type of data and the impact of that data being compromised um, that organisations just do not have a handle on at the moment. And this is where people are almost being led by the organisations where we've created this massive amount of data that people don't know the value of it. So to that end, it's, it's, people are not understanding the risks. There's a bit of overtrust that um, everything's going to be all right. Uh, there's also a view that the security people are probably um, trying to lock things down too much and um, almost on a a power trip of um, stopping people doing their jobs. Yeah, it's it always been a bit of a, um, a learning curve for a lot of people. And once people do understand the risks, and um, I, I've actually sat down and, and explained and, and used evidence um, where people have had data stolen, and, and the website I mentioned a couple of years ago, that's been um, almost a gold mine in getting people to understand the risks of doing a similar thing and the amount of data that can be captured. And that's one of the big issues, is people are just trying to do the job, but they don't actually understand the risks. Uh, sort of to expand on that, I think another common issue is because technology is now so ingrained in people's lives, it's very easy to, it blurs the line between personal devices and business usage. So. You'll find a lot of people get used to it. It's like, oh, I use this website all the time, and my personal 
laptop. So yeah, I've had no problems with it before. So of course I'll just go on to on the business account. It's not a problem. Um, and it's that they get comfortable using technology and they'll just do essentially what they're used to doing is just, and then that can lead to potential risks, as you say, and it's being about fully aware of what those risks are and the effect that it can have on the business. And, and, and even the most experienced and knowledgeable organizations um, can f fall foul of some of those risks, which anyone who tried to access the ICO website yesterday would have um, noticed because it was down. <laughs> Um, because they used a third-party plugin which got compromised and delivered crypto mining malware to any visitor's website. So even the most knowledgeable organization can f um, underestimate the risks of using certain technologies. Okay, just want to pick up something that you said, John, in part of your earlier answer there. You said, once people understand the risks, so how are we helping them to do so? Um, one thing, we've got our, our Plymouth um, IT training team have, have done a lot of great work in helping people to understand um, some of the risks with regards to data security and some of the training that we've now provided, which we haven't done um, until a couple of years ago. We didn't really do any detailed IT security training, and now we have a compulsory course which we um, present figures to um, management on a monthly basis. And it's all about getting people to sit down and think about the data they've got. And um, once we actually identify the high-risk areas, we can address those uh, with the appropriate training. But um, a lot of great work we've done in uh, HR and the training team, um, just getting the message out there. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, um, and sort of from biz, uh, business curious, you know, um, as part of implementing uh, ISO 27001, which is all about information security management, um, a lot of that we do training on risk workshops. So we'll literally sit down with like key members of the team, uh, staff, and go through their business or what they deal with and what potential risks they could face. and. You find that a lot of time people are dealing with these risks on a daily basis, but they're just, it's so natural to them. It's just like, oh yeah, well it happens all the time, so we'll just, we don't document it or anything like that. Um, but we actually can sit down with them, work through their area of business and actually help them figure out what actual risks to information they're actually dealing with and how to put in mitigation to reduce that. And, and, and we do a similar thing. We've got a document. If somebody's really determined to do something, we've got a document called a risk acceptance document where we document the service, all the risks associated with that, and then present it to the service owner to say, do you accept these risks and the consequences of um, um, them being exploited? And there's a web website that um, I'm currently working with now with one, an arm's length party where it captures quite a lot of sensitive data. And they're unwilling in the short term to, 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 to either take it offline or adopt other measures to reduce the risks. So I said, here are the risks, here's the document, sign it and um, you're okay. And once you actually present them with a document to sign, they start to have second thoughts and um, are looking at, okay, we can get some money to do it properly. Yeah, because when you, when you are working with risk, obviously you can put in technical things, you can put in policies and procedures to help reduce the risk, but you always end up with this residual risk because either the cost benefit isn't there, you know, you can make it something so secure that no one could ever use it, but obviously that's not really what you're after. So it's about getting, putting in what you can to get down to an acceptable level of risk where you can basically go, okay, we figured out what the remaining risk is, what kind of things we need to be aware of and keep an eye out for, um, but at that point you can just accept it and sort of carry on as normal. Question at the front here. Just before we get to the question, I'll just ask for another little show of hands from you. So how many of you are required to use information technology by your organisation? And how many of you, keep your hands around, uh, how many of you that are required to have been given some sort of awareness training on the risks? Okay, so a fair proportion of those that put their hands up 
um, say they are. Lots of people didn't put their hands up, which I find surprising. How many of you don't have hands this afternoon? Okay, a few people, right, fair enough. Uh, on with the question. Um, so, obviously, we're talking about uh, uh, high level uh, organizations dealing with technology, high level consequences, because there's lots of data involved, lots of sensitive information. Um, about low level users, uh, I know there can be people that they generally know the risks involved. They generally know that there are consequences to not applying to these rules or regulations, but are either convenience or laziness or wanting to make a quick buck or they just simply don't care. They, uh, they just don't apply to these regulations and put something out that is potentially compromised, vulnerable, um, just for their use. Like what, uh, what would be involved with that because um yeah you're always going to get those type of people that you know they fully understand it but um they also have to understand the consequences of, of actually um their actions would be classed as deliberate actions and the you just more get than a big likely, stick that's what you need. They're, they're, they're not going to end up as a, an employee of the organization and we had a situation a couple of years ago or it might be a year ago now, where um, somebody did just that. They were told exactly what the risks of um, implementing this new service were if they didn't do it properly. Um, they ignored all the advice they were given and just um, steamrolled it through, and they are no longer with our organisation now. Yeah, I mean, there is always that problem where you can't always control the human factor, and there is always a risk with that. Um, so you just have to put in the procedures around it to be, look, if you don't follow these rules, which we have, to keep our system secure, then there will be consequences. And, and, and also, that's why you do have some of the technical controls implemented. So the website filtering and the fact that on computers you can't install your own software. Because we, we can tell people um, you can't install your own software and trust them but there's always going to be one that installs everything he possibly can and um, compromise not just that computer, causes a lot of headaches to the service desk um, because things stop working. And um, those sort of people um, is where 80% of the work and the support is needed. Um, so you do need te technical controls to um, prevent that happening. Other questions? Like we have a hand there. Come on, Shannon. Oh, we have two hands. Keep you busy now. Thank you. Um, following on from Alan Good's talk about biometrics this morning, there's a lot of technology in that, and I presume we're going to see a lot more of biometrics. If the code that is used to secure the personal details of people is not very effectively executed and secured, what are the likely consequences then? Because I've only got one set of eyes, one set of fingers. I can't change them like a password. I can see that becoming really quite an issue in the future if the code which is using this biometric data and uh, maintaining the identity is spread too widely around and not kept secure. Um, well, on the corporate side, um GDPR will come down with a, because there is a data breach, you, you have to report it up to them and uh, they'll investigate and the company, if they haven't put the uh, necessary technical protection or, uh, in place, they will get a, a hefty fine on that. Um, but from a personal level, it is very worrying, I agree. Um, you know, a, a biometric is part of you, it doesn't change. I mean, the ten, you can change the algorithm slightly, um, to, you know, to try and alter the result to if there is a breach that they can't reuse that data but in the end it's it is still part of you um, and it just depends on what version of that information they are keeping so you normally find in biometrics what's kept is a, uh, a template it's not an actual it's not like a photo of your fingerprint it's just a series of uh, it's like a mapping um, so re uh, backwards engineering that it's not entirely impossible uh, it is a very long, complicated process, but luckily enough, if you change the algorithm so it collects the data slightly differently, then it should, in term, 
basically make your make it more secure again. But there is always a again res residual risk to that. And um, I mean, this is where some of the good things that GDPR is coming in now, or the new Data Protection Act, whereas passwords weren't even classed as sensitive, not even really personal data. Biometrics, you have to apply a lot more stringent controls around it, you have to manage it properly. And th this is, I'd say, in the early stages of the um, introduction of biometrics. I mean, they have been with us for over 20 years now, but it's only now that they're starting to be used properly and um, in commercial products. So it is appropriate at this time, moment in time that um, the appropriate controls are being implemented for them. Because you can change a password, um, but like you say, you can't change your finger. And you really have to um, assess who you're going to give your biometrics to yourself personally. That's the big thing. Um, if it's some... Um, uh, They probably already have parts of it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yes, I would, because they, they, they have a lot of biometric information about most people anyway. But whether um, a, a company in China that you'd not even heard of asks you for your biometrics for just signing up for a mail list, mailing list, I'd be very reluctant to give them that. So it's, it's, it's actually down to you to actually make the decision and... In uh, the earlier speech, it did mention consent is going to be needed for the management of biometrics. So this is where you get empowered to make that decision. And really, the guidance that Steve is referring to about passwords, there has to be a lot more guidance and a lot more understanding about wh when people hand over their biometrics to a company. I mean, I've got an iPhone. I sort of trust Apple more than uh, many companies. But... Uh, if I was using, for example, um, a Chinese generic smartphone, I'd not necessarily trust them. I, I think it also comes into how they've implemented it. So with biometrics, you can either have it so the what it's comparing against is stored locally, um, or you can do it via a cloud service. Obviously, on a local device, if you're only literally doing a local verification, in a way, it's a lot more secure than if you, if they're sending it up to the up to a cloud. But as a, as an end user, you're not going to be fully aware of that process. It comes down to um, trying to be aware of what company is trying to use that biometrics data for. Um, and under the data protection, Act, they will have to declare that, um, which which should make the decision of whether or not you're going to give that information a lot easier. Had another hand. Yep. Going along the lines of consequences that we spoke of earlier, especially on a personnel level, uh, could that not actually be a negative factor to risk? For example, uh, in our company, there are certain people that won't actually report a security incident for fear of the harsh repercussions such as disciplinary actions. And I was wondering what you thought on that. Um, we've managed to get a... a, a environment where staff are very, very um, confident and, and, and they feel secure to be able to report a data breach or any breach of the Data Protection Act um, because they know that the consequences are going to be appropriate for the actions taken. Now, if somebody's acting maliciously and deliberately, you know, they're never going to report that um, even in the most open environment. And it's there where you need the monitoring and the, the ability to be able to detect um, that sort of malicious activity and take the appropriate action afterwards. So we've had a, a situation a couple of years ago where um, a member of staff took home data and put it on their home PC and they didn't tell anyone, they knew that what they were doing was wrong but when their PC broke and they contacted IT to get it fixed that's when it got detected and they, they, you know, it's the those sort of deliberate actions, that's where the consequences um, need to be implemented, but um, those actions, you need something in place to be able to detect them. Yeah, I agree. I think it's definitely about trying to encourage a, a sort of a non-blame. So obviously if they are trying to do stuff maliciously, then there should be repercussions to that. But, you know, accidents happen, um, and as long as 
you can also learn from those. So, say for example, um, someone accidentally sent an email to the wrong person containing a list of customers. You know, it's it's very easy for someone to accidentally send an email to the wrong person. That is still technically a data breach because you're sending that personal information out to someone who shouldn't be in receipt. So, it's about being open, and I mean. If it's an accident, it's fair. You, you you can't really blame the employee for that, but you can then learn from that and try and put in technical thing, uh, constraints to sort of control that a little bit more. Um, you know, there's the one where uh, in Outlook, if you're trying to send confidential data, it will first flag up to confirm that you're sending it to the right person, that kind of stuff. So you can put in technical constraints to reduce like potential of those accidental breaches but if someone's trying to act maliciously then there's not really much you can really do and obviously that's where the repercussions should be happening instead of an accidental breach. And, and also you, you introduce things such as um, failure to report and this is part of the new data protection requirements, failure to report is as serious as um, a malicious breach and needs to be treated as um, with the same sort of seriousness. So at what point would a mistake become consistent? So for example, uh, sending one wrong email by mistake, but mm -hmm. still by sending, let's say, four or five by mistake, at what point would disciplinary measures be required or acceptable? Um, it depends on the nature of this mistake, but ideally, the whole point of breach management is to identify the root cause and common themes. So if emails are being sent incorrectly all the time, you, you need to think about, okay, how can we improve this? Is it something as simple as um, two people got similar surnames? So um, I received a sensitive email this morning, which I picked up on my laptop here, from someone in HR who was sending the email to some, someone with the same surname as me. So, okay, do we s split those people out for different departments and identify them differently? Look at the root cause and what can we do to improve this? So if someone's constantly doing it, you need to think about what else can we do, and then after we've implemented all those controls and that mitigation, if they're still doing it, then you've got a competency issue. Yeah, you, you, you want to sort of go down the route of trying to train them first. Um, so you, keep a, you try and keep a track of sort of breaches and what's going on. And you know, if it does start to become a trend that someone is consistently breaking and sending uh, emails out to the wrong person. Obviously you'd want to train them first and be like, sit down with them and be like, go through it with them. And then after the training, if it keeps on consistently happening, then you probably should start trying to think about <laughs> seeing what's really going on there. Any more questions in the room at the moment? We do. Susie will come with the microphone this time. It's a question about the standards, both ISO and GDPR. Um, I can understand and appreciate that ISO standards will still continue after Brexit, but do you see any changes that uh, need to be made to the Data Protection Act, which are being considered in government or working parties, which Brexit will force? I mean, I think sort of from the get-go, uh, the, the ICO has already stated that um, even with Brexit happening, GDPR will still be the regulation which we keep to. Um, in regards to any specific changes, um, I think that will come down to sort of more of the specifics of what happens during the negotiations and uh, obviously making adjustments as and when necessary. It is an evolving product. It is. I mean, it, it's not even had its second reading in the Commons yet. There's already been 64 pages of amendments made to the Data Protection Act in the House of Lords, um, it does amend the GDPR text though. Although the new Data Protection Act implements all of GDPR into UK law, it's actually added in, oh, it's, it's um, got 75 different amendments um, with that GDPR text, so things like any reference to member states is changed to the United Kingdom. It's actually taken out 13 pages of the GDPR text. So GDPR, as, as the original document, um, when implemented into UK law, um, Brexit's going to be irrelevant because um, we would have implemented it in a UK state that's completely different. 
um, yeah. to the original European one. Yeah, and uh, there, you do find that there is differences in GDPR across different nations because um, I think the most easy one to sort of think of is um, age of consent. So different countries have different ages of consent. So even though we all, all the countries are following GDPR, they are all slightly amended versions. So it's about being aware of the more specifics. And <clears throat> slightly off topic, I think. But um, everything seems to come back to GDPR this, uh, at, at this current moment in time. More questions? Any more, any more? We have one at the back, and we have one there. Gosh, I'm confused now. Uh, over here first. Um, I was just going to ask about organisations. Are they more? Do you think they're becoming more proactive, or do you think they're still being reactive to security th issues? So once the data has been breached, do you think they're more reactive, or do you think they're putting more in place to prevent this? A bit of both. Um, we're, we're reactive to things we didn't know about. Um, we've also got monitoring in place um, to be proactive, but it, it is generally a reactive um, environment. You don't know what's going to go wrong until it happens. I mean, I, from working with Insecurious, I mean, even though I've only been there a couple of months, I've already seen the increase of sort of people trying to, like businesses trying to actually implement uh, cyber security, you know, even as basic as doing a Cyber Essentials Plus. Um, companies, you know, you think back a few years, a lot of companies wouldn't even bother thinking about it, but nowadays I think more and more companies are actually starting to be more proactive thinking about it. Um, going back to GDPR, I think that's definitely because of uh, the published potential fines. I think a lot of companies now are sort of definitely pulling in, uh, trying to be more compliant and uh, implement some cybersecurity controls for that. And, and you have to bear in mind that we've built up data over the last 20, 30 years um, without really thinking about it. But the IT industry is almost like the car industry in the 60s when you didn't have to wear seat belts. People would make cars that almost were death traps and um, quite knowingly made cars that were dangerous. Um, because there was no, no consequences. These days, the car industries, but the cars are really safe and they've got airbags and things like that. Um, we're getting to that stage in the IT industry, and especially in IT security, where people are st still catching up and we're still going to be reactive for a number of years until we've got everything in place and then you can start thinking about being more proactive and um, being safer. Thank you. I had another question at the back there. Um, I think that actually leads very neatly onto what I was going to ask a question about, which was firstly that people are terrible at assessing risks. It's not just IT risks, it's any type of risks, and particularly if they're invisible risks. So it's what role do uh, accreditations and things like kite marks have in helping people make sensible judgments when it comes to selecting uh, products and things that are safe? And I think it leads on from your point about the car industry and, and how they've uh, developed that. Well, I mean, I'm not sure if ki um, kite marks helped, um, but what did help was legislation changing and enforcing things like seat belts. I mean, who would have thought in 1982, um, where probably half the room was born before 1982, you didn't have to wear a seatbelt in a car. It was your choice. Now, that legislation, when it came in, um, there was a initial um, outcry and people were unhappy about it. But these days, people just get in the cars, put the seatbelt on without thinking twice about it. Um, and... Uh, the whole accreditation kite mark type, type thing, did people really pay, pay attention to that or did they... Um, sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay, it was obviously a question that made more sense in my head. Uh, I was thinking more around things like uh, if you were buying a, a step ladder, it would have a kite mark on it to say this has been assessed to a certain standard, you mm. can buy this and feel confident that this is okay, which helps the consumer make uh, intelligent choices about risk much easier. It was that sort of uh, application of uh, 
tight marks in their general sense as opposed to the specific so, so, sense. So, yeah, so you buy a stepladder from B&Q, you trust B&Q to sell you something that's not going to... Well, they'll, they'll have an actual safety mark. It's past yeah. certain tests, therefore you can buy this and, and use it safely. And what we haven't got is things like the way biometrics are being used at the moment. Uh, I think you mentioned it's all down to the implementation that's important. Mm. It might look exactly the same to a consumer, but has it actually been implemented in a sensible way? And in order for that to be easy for a consumer to understand, it's what role that sort of uh, accreditation might play in helping people make sensible choices on risk. Well, one of the big areas I see that there's definite need for that type of assurance is in websites. Websites are probably one of the biggest risk areas um, that exist now. Someone, anyone can develop a website, put a form on to collect data. Um, that doesn't have to have any, any validation. It could be subject to so many different types of attacks. Um, but people have just got to trust because there's a website, we'll put our data in it. But there is no um, national or even regional accreditation for a website that says you can trust this. So yes, there is a definite need for that um, type of thing. And I have um, been involved with Mike, a guy called Mike Deeroff who works for um, Bit Security. They've got a program called Hacked where they identify people in Plymouth who are leaning towards um, moving into the sort of dark web type activities. Um, but I, we've been talking because there's also an opportunity to engage with developers um, and, and businesses who produce websites to enforce a minimum level of security and development standards um, in order to have websites that could be secure. So. Um, very early days at the moment, but it is something that's needed nationally, without a doubt. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, some of the certifications out there and stuff, you know, can really help end users to get a good idea of sort of if if their company which they're working with or you know, thinking of buying from have actually thought about security. Uh, one of the key ones I can think of is the PC, uh, PCI DSS, which is the payment card system. Um, you know, if a company payment card uh, accreditation, it means that they've gone through the effort of uh, putting in the technical protections in place to make sure that when they take card payments that that data is secure. Now if you compare that against a company which doesn't have the accreditation as an end user, you can easily distinguish between, well I'll go for the one which has got a, cert a certification to say that they are going to protect my data. Um, and you, you see more and more companies as they go out there are requesting their client or the people that they work with to get these accreditations. Um, the one I can think of is the Cyber Essentials. Um, I know that a lot of MOD contracts, it's a requirement that if you work with them, you have to have at least have a Cyber Essentials certification. Um, and that's that slowly as more and more people become aware of these certifications and what they're actually showing, um, it is pushing more people to trust these accreditations because they do help. And, and people need to understand what they mean. I've just looked under, under bottom of this microscope, uh, microphone, sorry. Um, it's got a CE mark, which I know something to do with Europe, but don't actually know what it means. Um, and that's the key thing. People need, if you're going to get kite marks and accreditations, they need to be publicized and people need to have trust and understand what exactly they mean. I wonder why you were looking at the bottom of your microphone. <laughs> okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we are tumbling towards the end of the session. Does anybody have any last question, questions they'd like to ask? Hands high if you do. So, oh, we do, right at the front here. Thank you. Going back to an earlier point you said about uh, adoption of the biometrics, you said it's up to the consumer to make the choice, but do you think it could reach a point where most consumers choose yes on biometrics such that those who would not like biometrics are kind of forced to adopt them? Uh, yes, it could. However, one thing that isn't going to change is, um, not, not for the next 20 years anyway, or maybe 10, is the fact that to use the biometrics, you do need the explicit consent or you need um, legitimate interest, etc. So 
consent is the easiest way to um, be able to use special categories of data, which biometrics will be um, classed as. Um, so you, you'll always have to have get, uh, people to give consent. There'll never be a, a situation where they have to hand over that information. Um, much the same as now is that there's always a cash option in most cases, except for London buses. But um, people yeah. all, always need the options. Yeah, I'd agree. It's one of those ones where biometrics like, will become more and more common used um, in the industry and as end users. Um, but it will either get to a point where if society does move to where it's in all biometrics, hopefully by that point there will be enough controls and technical standards in place to make it a lot more secure. Uh, secure. But like most things like uh, contactless cards and stuff like that, you know, this is all new technology which people have concerns about. Um, and there is still always other choices and I don't see, at least in a, in a while, a world where it's all biometrics. No, because you have to, have to bear in mind as well with the uh, diversity of people, not everyone is able to give us, um, give their thumbprint or fingerprint because um, they just don't have that capability. So there's always has to be a range of different options for people to be able to authenticate their IDs. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I will ask one last question of the panel and ask them each for a, a quick answer on it. So, folks... If you could recommend or choose one thing to be done to get alignment between what businesses and users each want and what the technology can do, what thing would that be? I'm giving you a magic wand. Okay, I'll say it again, I've confused them now. So if we could choose one thing to get alignment, one thing that would achieve alignment between what businesses and users each want from the technology, so two communities with potentially different needs, and what the technology can do, how would we do it? I think you're asking too much there. I might be. <laughs> um, the only thing I can think is just greater education amongst, uh, amongst people, um, just in the risks. Um, the implications and what they're trying to do and that that's also in they need greater um, education in be able to communicate with the technology providers what their needs are okay thank you Stuart uh, in a perfect world it would be that everything is secure so it doesn't matter what a user does so they can do whatever they want and it'll be secure but obviously that's uh, never going to happen <laughs> um, in reality um, it would be Just a, I think it's segregation. So at the moment, there's a lot of technology out there which allows you, uh, users to split their, like for example, their phone. You can split the phone in sort of a work segment and a personal segment. Um, you know, I I see that technology going a lot further where you sort of you've got that one device which you can use for work purposes and you can use it for personal purposes, and the technical controls in place where you can keep both sides secure, but the business can control the business side and the user can control the user side. Okay, thank you very much. So I asked a difficult question there inadvertently. I'll remember that one to start with next time. Um, other than that though, folks, thank you very much indeed to the panel.